Hi everyone, welcome to lecture five in um, strategic marketing management where I'll discuss today segmentation, targeting and positioning strategies. Here's a comment from Jay Frampton uh, and, and his observations about the best global brands of 2012. In order to succeed, brand owners must become more sensitive to the needs and desires, desires of informed and discerning customers who demand high degrees of engagement and consistency and increasingly the capacity of brands to develop existing relationships and develop new ones relies on their ability to leverage new technology in the service of human connection. So more than ever before, competition for uh, consumers is much higher. Uh, the sophistication that we want and the level of engagement that we want with consumers is much more demanding. So if you're trying to th work out where we are in, in the subject, we're sort of at this level here where we're looking at developing strategies. So the first part was the analysis that we did previously. Now we're actually looking at um, the strategies that we're going to develop before we implement them in our marketing plan. So the focus of the lecture today is to develop an understanding of the steps involved in market segmentation and targeting. For some of you this will be old ground but there's always uh, new wrinkles that we can add to this area. Whoops. An understanding of the steps involved in brand positioning. Now brand positioning is slightly different. Here we're positioning away from our competitors and hopefully towards uh, consumers' uh, needs and wants and tastes and preferences. So the process of developing strategies in this level, of course, must be consistent with our overall strategic positioning of the firm. Segmentation then leads to the targeting of particular consumer groups or business groups. The positioning of our brands or our company towards that area and how we do that by the customer value creation mix. So target market selection is the first part here is based on the partitioning of market into segments of existing and potential customers. Now why potential? Because we want to have a growth strategy in the future with similar characteristics and similar needs. The tech, talk, the text talks about the four W's or a way that this might be implemented. The first thing you need to know is who is the market you're talking about. And I suppose the second rule is to remember where you are not the market. And we can classify the market in terms of their description, in terms of demographics, freely available, socioeconomics, similar, stage of life, life cycle, uh, do they have children, are they retired, lifestyle, and psychographics. The what and where looks at how people are making decisions. So we might actually look at the brands they're using, the types of users, are they heavy users, are they people borrowing products, um, what are they using the products for, the type of distribution outlet, are they buying online or in a retail store, behavioural targeting, um, are they people who have received coupons or not from us, and so on. The next section is the why part of this process, which is really looking at the benefits that this market is chasing and the value that they're trying to get. Now value is really defined in marketing as uh, simply as what you get and what you're prepared to pay for. Now remember paying is not necessarily money. It might be effort, it might be uh, the psych the um, both psychological and physical. So for example, IKEA sells furniture of great benefit and value. But to some markets, this is not a great value because you've got to install the furniture, put it together. Here are some bases of segmentation which you might be familiar with for both consumer and industrial markets. The most popular ones here to use are based on consumption patterns, um, loyalty patterns, because we're actually looking at um, differences based on actual behaviour. Industrial markets, because they're smaller and we tend to know more about our customers, are easier to segment and some of those are listed there. So what are some of the approaches we can take in segmentation? Well, we can use a normative approach, which by, by analysing people's responsiveness to prices and marginal revenues and so on. So this is used really by airlines and by hotels to look at prices people will pay for either the different types of rooms or different classes of airfares, first class versus economy, premium economy. We may use what's called a priori. Here we rely on secondary 
sources. For example, we may have collected or know of uh, data about people's lifestyles and values, or we might know something about their demographics or the, the benefits that they have sought. And we form segments on the basis of that. Post hoc is where we take a market segmentation study and we will use uh, approaches like cluster analysis. Uh, we don't really know or we don't have in mind, so post hoc stands for after the fact, a priori before, uh, what the segments are. So this is particularly useful in new markets uh, and uh, I guess where a priori segmentation hasn't worked too well. And the last one, organisations these days have a lot of information about um, customer interactions, particularly those that occur online, and this can and we can also look for patterns and clusters in this data for a meaningful way of segmenting our markets. So what are the criteria then for good market selection? Well, we basically want to see that these people want the same thing. The segment should be different from other segments. If not, we're better off targeting the whole market. The size of the market has got to be worth our while in terms of, of numbers, but also in terms of profitability. There should be potential in the growth market. So one of the uh, challenges, for example, in opera and classical music is literally that the market is dying. And these people are getting older, and, uh, for, and, and so subscription services for concerts and opera are, are in decline in many parts of the world. Do we have access to the channels? Uh, if if uh, people are making decisions online, do we actually have an online uh, shopping cart or a way of doing that? Or do we have access to a channel of distribution in a particular country or geographic area? That's not always possible. Uh, are people likely to be responsive to the approach we make? So for example, if uh, Charles Sturt University was to claim to be the best university in the country, would people really respond to that? The intensity of, uh, the, of, of competition, we try and find segments which aren't being served by other markets or where we believe we have a competitive advantage. Barriers to entry, such as access to distribution channels, um, switching costs and switching barriers, um, which we looked at with Michael Porter's analysis, each of that can be used for, for a segment. We would look at that as well. Uh, the level of customer satisfaction with existing products, often that may be an opportunity for us, although in some cases, particularly in the mobile phone market, satisfaction and trust may be so low that people may be not willing to switch. Potential for the introduction of a game changer or a new product innovation. Uh, that might be another segment uh, basis that we might look for a segment to target. Here's an example of a segmentation strategy used in Australia for a long time. This is the Roy Morgan values from Roy Morgan Research. And you can see it's clustered according to people's price expectations, their acceptance of innovation and their progressiveness. And then we've got life satisfaction, individual and quality expectations. So some of the larger segments you can see are those that like a traditional family life and those who are after what we might call visible achievement. And there are, of course, with every good segmentation strategy, a description of who this market is. So I'm going to focus on this group here, which is about 8% of the, um, uh, the results, or 8% of the market, which are young, opt young optimists. Okay, so as I said, remember, the market, you're not the market. Okay, so what are the, what are kinds of the lifestyle values here? Young offers are into fashion style, but not fads and fashion. They want to try everything, such as bungee jumping, skydiving, whitewater rafting, travel. So very experiential. They play hard. They travel. They work hard and play hard. Being innovative and innovative and interested in technology. And you can read the rest of that. So this is a description. It says something about their behaviour. It's something obviously that applies to areas like travel and technology that you can see straight away, or even career. Industrial companies can also use segmentation. Here's one from your text. So customers, we could we could uh, segment our market on the basis of where they were, in the decision making process, first time prospects, novices, and sophisticated users, and all these may have quite different types of behaviour. Well, consider this. Assume that you're in the market, you're a market, you're in a marketing manager of a motor vehicle brand selling for a car around 45000 
which basis for segmentation would be suitable. And think about all the different models. So here's a whole bunch of cars I've downloaded that are around about 45,000. And clearly you can see they're not all the same. So people are making different decisions based on straight away you might say features, but it also might be who they are, what they use these cars for, the benefits, the brands, and so on. Once segments have been formed, the next issue is to decide which segment should be selected. And it should really confine with the following. We want to have something that we can do, uh, a differential in the competitive strategy, so some sort of advantage that we've got. So targeting a luxury segment may not be a good strategy if we haven't got anything differential in that strategy. Should be capable of being isolated so the competitive advantage can be preserved. So for example, in the first time car buyer with the four cylinders car, have we got some sort of advantage that we can preserve in that area? It must be valid even though it can be imitated later. The next process then or step is what we might is then how we will position the brand itself. And here we're actually looking at the relationship of how the consumer sees our brand in relation to the organization, the way it's portrayed in the mass and social media, and the way it's portrayed by other consumers. Another consideration might be where people are in their decision set. People may not have, have never heard of our brand. They may be aware of their brand, but it might be not, they may not think the brand is very good. So we might need to take a long-term strategy, as was the case with Korean and Japan and Japanese car, um, car companies, to move to move brands more to the evoked or inert set, more to the evoked set rather. Focusing on brand attributes that matter, that move you from one area to another, is important here. And research or published in McKinsey Quarterly a few years ago highlights the idea of looking for differentiation that is high and has high relevance. Okay, Although you might have low in differentiation, but it can be provided easily by other competitors. And this is something that's often a challenge in the tertiary education sector. Here's an example of this from some research I did, I was involved with a few years ago, in selecting a mobile service provider in Australia. And you can see uh, some of the attributes are listed here. Now, I, what I can tell you is these attributes vary across age groups. Um, having a handset and coverage is much more important for younger consumers, but service as you get older becomes more important. And you can see some other important attributes now, that most of these decisions are actually, or most, uh, a majority of the decisions are not bought online, people actually go to a physical store. Once people decide to buy, they will make decisions pretty quickly, and about 16% of the population have changed in 12 months. And we could split these up by brands, we could reconfigure this information, but the key aspect here would be to look at those attributes that are quite important in differentiating brands. And things like service, um, uh, wanting a new handset uh, is is quite an important area, as long as as well as coverage. This is also showed if we look at the different brands might do well on different things here. So we can see that uh, brand one here does well on nutrition, uh, um, but not so well on being low fat or sugar. Brand two better on sugar, but not so well on nutrition, and so on. But the key attribute, the key decisions here from this research would be to isolate which of these attributes fed into consumer choices. Now the customer value creation mix is the last step of the process where we design, if you like, the positioning strategy for that brand. And it's an extension of the traditional concept of the marketing mix uh, to include organization-wide, so often people and uh, places are talked about here uh, along the or along the value chain network. Now in helping us uh, position our brands against competitors and also to help us with segmentation there are two um, research approaches which you should be aware of. One is what we call perceptual maps. These are simply pictures of maps of a product category. Another is conjoint analysis. So what this is a brand approach here which looks at attributes or how people uh, might make decisions based on benefits that they might get from a brand. 
Okay, so attributes, the attribute rating method, um, data is analyzed by fact, and the, so we can ask them to attributes, or we can just look, if we're not sure what the attributes are, we can simply ask them to um, basically say how similar or dissimilar various brands are, and from those similarity distances, we can come up with what's called a perceptual map, which looks something like this. Uh, this is referenced in your textbook. This is from uh, senior managers earning 150000 a year. And these brands are positioned based on similarity. So in other words, BMW is seen as quite different from Volvo, whereas uh, Audi and Saab and even Toyota, sorry, Toyota and Audi are seen as similar. These attributes along this graph here come from uh, our understanding of the brands. And you can see it's priced from high to low down here. So that's one. And then financial effectiveness is from high to low along here in terms of cost. Okay. Conjoint analysis, on the other pro, on the other hand, segments the market with similar needs, and these needs we infer from by how they value attributes. So consumers are presented with a number of attributes, and they've asked to rank them uh, either best or worst, or from one to five, or usually pairs. So we get the, what we call these utility measures, which is how much they relate to the overall choice. And in this one, this example is for a vacuum cleaner. And the first one, you can see that the brand name only has some impact on the decision. The second one is the price. Often we'll ask price. Of course, most consumers would like to pay the lowest price or nothing. So we, we try and look for a price which is somewhere in between. So I think this was a carpet bag cleaner from, from, from memory. You can see the, uh, 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 the impact of a good housekeeping seal. That's words, another certification is not seen as that important by the market, uh, whereas a money back guarantee is. So in designing this product, we might focus on a money back guarantee and prices as being the two. But there may be different segments which might have different combinations of these attributes. This is overall market. The next slide just shows you that by once you gain this uh, information about attributes here, you can, you can use an approach called cluster analysis, or we can just look at different regions. And here's from some research I came online, uh, came across online, which looks at uh, differences in attributes of printers across a number of markets. As you can see, compared to um, uh, China and the USA, for example, printer function is much more important in the United States, uh, whereas brand name is slightly more important and cost is more important in China. That's it for now. Uh, there's a lot more in your textbook and in other notes I've got. Thanks for your attention and I hope you're enjoying this subject. Bye.